Good morning. Well, what a great evening. And once again, I want to thank NASA uh, for providing that amazing opportunity. And I want to thank Rory Kennedy for uh, sharing that film and allowing us to view it. So thank you for that. So today is a monumental moment for us here. This week, we have over 28 states. We have one US territory and four countries represented. And together, we will impact over one million children. Together, we can do this. Last year, at the end of last year, I left a major corporation. And when I did that, I said, I still want to be involved in STEM. I care deeply about it. And I feel all too often that we just look at this as a word, as an acronym. So I reached out to the STEM associations about my transition, about this big idea. And in early January, we actually came together. And the NEA was kind enough to host us, allow us to use their space. And we started to engage in a conversation about the importance of integrated STEM. And that's where the STEM Leadership Alliance launched. Why do we need to change education? You think about Paul Hurd. He concluded through his research on a national survey of student achievement. He said, we are raising a new generation of Americans that is scientifically and technologi technologically illiterate. Our once unchallenged premise in commerce, industry, science and technology, innovation is being overtaken by competitors throughout the world. And what was unimaginable a generation ago has begun to occur as others are matching and surpassing our educational attainment. If this is all starting to sound a little bit familiar, it should. Because these remarks are actually from a nation at risk back in 1983. And what happened with the nation at risk, that was supposed to be a wake up call for the country. We were supposed to say, we're going to start to change our education system we're going to have a more engaging conversation, yet what is still occurring? School systems and school districts are still not getting the attention that they need and deserve. And our children are the ones that are suffering. And corporations keep saying, well, we don't have the workforce that we need. We're not getting the skills that are necessary. And students say, well, why am I learning this? Am I ever going to use this? So we've all heard that. We, and then we hear, when you talk to schools, you talk to out-of-school providers, and they say, oh, we're, we're doing STEM, we have STEM. We have STEM electives, oh, we're doing it over here. But the problem is it's disconnected. Everybody's doing it in these little pockets, and it's not true integration. So what we do is we lean on that tried and true research. The research that say kids learn best when they're actively engaged. Well, heck, everybody learns better when you're engaged in the work. Yet so much of the learning is taught in this kind of sit and get sort of way. We have the kids just sit there, we're feeding them the information, and then we're wondering, well, why aren't you understanding this? Why aren't you connecting the dots? So it turns out that this factory farming model of classroom instruction and school programming doesn't quite cater to the learning that connects the dots. And so why is that? A couple points on that. First of all, there's an over-reliance on data. And this is where I'm not saying data is a bad thing. What I am saying, though, this is where data is kind of a dirty word. And it's that because we use it to define the parameters in which we instruct. We traditionally, and especially in schools that are deemed unperforming, we allocate the majority of the instructional time to reading and writing interventions. And we're always preaching reading and writing across the curriculum, which leads to haphazard implementation. The second point is as a result, we've created a subject called ELA, which is the heaviest lean is explicit reading and writing instruction. So we read poems and then we talked about them. And now we switch to what was called English literature. Now, because we're so focused on state exams, and that percentile focus, we've lost the sight of the fact that in order to create good readers and writers, they need to have something to write about, to inspire their attention to text or video as actual alternative to Twitter and Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and on and on and on. 
And to do that, to truly engage students and inspire them to curiosity, they need to be solving problems. Using society as a mirror to understand the world as they come to age and develop persistence and vision through a productive struggle. So that is what engagement is about. And guess who can still use data to be productive and identify the how? And that comes back to all of you, that we start to use it in a new way. And the third part that I wanted to talk about was with the programming. We use this traditional Bell system. We create, we divide subject matters into neat little boxes or silos, a word that you're going to hear frequently at this conference. And why do we do that? Because academic policy sets us up to say that's what we have to do. 300 minutes of this, 400 minutes of that per week, so on and so on. But does that mean that a student actually gets an actual 300 hours of English language arts instruction? And are they going to be better readers and writers because of that? So what are we really trying to get at? What are we really trying to inspire in our children? Are we really trying to get them to think about subjects in silos? Or are we really trying to get them to think about the importance of integration and connecting the dots? And that's what we're trying to do this week. We're trying to think about how do we begin to transform the way that we think about education, the way that we're having a conversation about true integrated STEM, to create these moments that children walk away and say, I got it, I understand it. I want to be the next biomedical engineer. I want to be a wearable device engineer. I want to be the next teacher. I want to do this because I saw the connection and the light came on. And what has tended to happen is that when we create these silos of learning, kids are suffering because they're not getting that magic moment. So what our charge here today is that at the end of this week, we're going to say we want every single one of you to take back something and implement it and we're gonna pick a day, we're saying right now, September 18th, because we have Pi Day and we have Day of Code. Well, why not have STEM Day, but start STEM Day as every day? And we start to realize that students see the connections. And if we start to create this movement, we truly will impact over one million students. So that's why we're here. And that's what we're going to do. And we're going to build this alliance to a very, very big level because we really believe that we are the future and we can do this collectively. So without further ado, I want to turn it over to David Evans, uh, the president, uh, executive director of NSTA, the National, Soci NSTA, the National Science Teaching Association. They recently went through a name change. And I'm going to turn it over to David to talk a little bit about NSTA. So thank you. Oh, good morning, everyone. Hey, people are awake. That's great. Thank you, Kelly. I appreciate that. So um, I, I just basically want to welcome you here and tell you a little bit of my thoughts about this event. And uh, when I was putting those thoughts together, I, uh, I, I have to tell you, I I'm very, have a very formal process for making speeches. Three or five cards, if any of you remember what they were like. And I, and I found the cards that I used last year. And uh, it, it struck me that, that that might be a really appropriate way to try and welcome everyone and kick things off this year. Um, last year, the conference dealt a lot with the very, uh, you know, the sort of 50,000 foot level view of what STEM was. There was a lot of talk about how we build alliances and pull people together. And, and I looked at my own notes, and, and I talked a lot about the importance of science education for everybody and the connection between science and STEM and, and what that meant. But it was all pretty high-level stuff. And, um, and you take a look at the agenda for this year, and although it doesn't seem sometimes like we're making a lot of progress, I think we've made huge progress over the last year. Because while a lot of the emphasis last year was on this very high level, when you take a look at this week's agenda, it's really kind of right down there in the weeds. It's all about practicing STEM. It's all about 
understanding what an integrated program means as opposed to here's the math part and here's the science part and there's the engineering over there and yeah, we've all got to use technology. It's all much more focused on the content, the nitty gritty and, and, and what we need to be teaching. And, and for a, an event like this, that is a huge step forward. Uh, we can always put together programs where people talk about their own particular programs, their own particular emphasis, and, and it's easy to say STEM is just four letters that string together, you know, that form part of a traditional curriculum. But, but in fact, I think the fact that the emphasis of our program this year is on integrated STEM is really reflective of what we need and what we actually want to, to deal with those high-level problems that we talked about last year. And those problems, you know, basically are workforce. Children need to have jobs, and the jobs are changing. That's pretty easy to understand. And they also had to do with what I, what I like to call citizenship, and, and that is everybody needs to have a basic understanding of science and technology and engineering practices just to live in the world that we live in today. And, and so that, that, that's all fine, but what it means to pull those together is, is really quite something different. And although we tend to think in those divided categories, in fact, the world doesn't really work that way. And I can just tell you a little story about myself and then I'll let you get on with your program. Uh, so my background is in oceanography. I study the physics of the ocean. And uh, it turns out, like many scientists in many areas, that, uh, that I didn't have the instruments, there were no instruments available to measure the things that I needed to measure to understand what I wanted to understand about the ocean, so I had to end up building them. Uh, all of a sudden, I'm engaged in a STEM career because I had to build the thing to measure what I wanted to measure to understand the way the world worked in a particular, uh, in, in a particular area. And, and the constraints that are associated with building something for real to work on a real problem are at the heart of most people's science. And, and so this notion that the, the, that the subjects are separate is one that actually is rather foreign, I think, to scientists on the one hand, and it's certainly foreign to, to engineers on the other. So the notion of focusing on integrated STEM is actually one of, of actually looking at the way we do real work in the real world, and, and I think that that's what our our program is actually all about this year. And so with that, with that in mind, that is stepping away from the high level where we all, I think, have substantial agreement, we have to get down to the nitty gritty of what does that actually mean. And, and I'd like to make one final argument, and, and that is that in a very practical way, we collectively, this community, have already addressed the high level problem. There's lots of conversation in the country about STEM education. Nobody knows quite what it means, but there's lots of conversation about that. Uh, 43 states and the District of Columbia have adopted new science teaching standards since the publication of NGSS or since the publication of the framework for K-12 science. Uh, most states have math curricula that look very much like the kind of participative problem-based curriculum that we're talking about. Many states have adopted computer science curricula or requirements uh, of a, or standards in, in a variety of ways. So if you think about the political part of the problem being, how do you get states to go along? How do you deal with departments of education? How do we get the community behind us? Well, I want to tell you that part's done. We've got those standards in place. And what we actually need to do now, what I would argue is the next step in integrated STEM, in integrated STEM instruction, is providing the professional learning that teachers need, providing the resources in classroom that teachers and students need together, figuring out what it actually means to bring the community into a conversation about our schools in a meaningful way, and actually implementing those high-level standards that have already been agreed to. So let's focus this week about what instruction looks like. Let's focus this week on what solving real problems look like, on characterizing a problem, characterizing a problem based on understanding the way the world works, and actually accomplishing something and doing a real task, which in my mind is really at the heart of the whole thing. And so let's take advantage of the fact that from a practical point of view, let, let's admit that the political part of the problem is solved, or as solved as you ever get in, in our world. 
and move on with the fact that what we really need to do is begin to teach children in a different way. That we've essentially got the authority to teach children in a different way. Let's work it from the bottom up. Let's work our supporters for STEM education to help support that rather than making a new program. And let's move ahead with integrated STEM instruction. Thank you very much and have a fabulous week.